First of all, I'd like to welcome you uh, to our internet interaction section, Gas Hub and Gas Exchange, a facilitator of threat to the golden age of gas. I hope that today we will all present a very interesting discussion. Students will be active and ask the questions. Uh, we also will pre we prepare for you questions to answer, and uh, all our uh, experts will uh, have a presentation and very interesting discussion too. So let me present you uh, our expert. First of all, I'd like to present uh, Mr. Ross McWay, the head of research and analytics, uh, Gazprom Marketing and Trading Limited. Please. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Yuri Virabian, President, Gazprom Marketing and Trading France. Sebastian Groblinhoff, Vice President, Supply Russia, Eon Global Commodities. <laughs> David Salfati, Vice, Pre uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Vice President, Supply East, Energy Management and Trading, NG. <laughs> Konstantin von Old Oldenburg, Head of Department, Gas Purchase East, VNG. Elen Rinalda, uh, Department of Sales and Liquid Markets, Gastera. <laughs> Vyacheslav Kusov, Head of uh, Directorate, uh, Department of Exchange Trade Operations, Gazprom. <laughs> and also Dmitry Katulski, Deputy Head of Department of Exchange Trade Operations, Gazprom. He will join us a little bit later. And of course, our moderators, first of all, Gerd Grieving, uh, our Director of External Relations, Interaction with Government Authorities, Gastera. <laughs> and me, Marina Puchkova, St. Petersburg State University of Economics. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I suggest uh, my moderator of the section, Mr. Grieving, to start this section with the explanation of uh, why we choose such uh, an interesting topic for today's discussion. Gas hubs, gas exchange, a facilitator or a threat? Okay, good morning, ladies. Not so much ladies here, we have more <laughs> ladies in the room. That's the reason I'm going to walk along, because you have to wake up, because we want to have real debate. We have questions for you, and you have to answer them, and you see immediately the results. But anyway, we heard yesterday stories about the value chain, the perspective of the natural gas business in Europe and Russia, and we are focusing today on the market developments in Europe. I hope all of you are ready for Europe. We will talk about Europe. Europe is changing because we have another market structure than we have in Russia. It is more liquid, and we see results of this market-driven economy with its impact, a huge impact. Companies who were dealing in the past with natural gas sales are squeezing out because the margins to make your business are becoming smaller and smaller. Long-term contracts we have been hearing yesterday. It will be extremely difficult to sell long-term contracts in Europe anymore. Is that the answer to the energy security for Europe? I have no idea. Maybe you have, have a have a feeling about that, but Europe is going to be very short delivered and very short security of supply. If that is good for the politics, I don't care. The market is providing it. And the market is setting the scene. And if you want to fight the market, it will be extremely difficult because the market will overrun you. That's more or less what we see in Europe today. What we see now is a new battle in Europe. It's amazing we don't see those players anymore in the room. But if you look to the retail market in Europe, we see that more and more groups of consumers are buying energy. They produce their own energy, like solar, wind, earth heat, we heard yesterday, and those end consumers have their own way of dealing with energy. And they buy some of them, which is not available on their own, on the market. And they can go themselves. New competitors, new entrants, new players. I will, I will tell you two you will be amazed. One of the players is IKEA. The other player is BMW. 
And you will say, BMW, they run cars, correct. Maybe they are not so clean as Volkswagen, you never know, but the new cars, like the Apple cars, have big batteries. And if you connect the big batteries to your house and you have your own energy supply, you have a balancing tool. And these new players, you don't see them here. So the big question maybe to the panel is, all of them, they are representing certain companies, over five years, will be the same? Or will we see here maybe Ikea, or BMW, or Tesla, or Apple, which has announced to go ahead with electric cars? So the market is really thrilling, changing, and we see a new battlefield how we are going to deal with energy in the future. That's a quite sexy story. We were looking yesterday for a sexy story. I think this is a really sexy story because it gets more to the end consumers and those who have good contact to the end consumers will win the battle, in my view. Nevertheless, we have to deal with the past. We have to deal with the future. We still have huge projects on the road to keep Europe warm and dealing with our electricity needs. They are, will grow, for sure. We are indeed, what we are saying in Europe, we are an energy market free of it, and we're trying to do as much as possible on emissions. We are burning coal, we are emitting a lot of emissions. So the political story, we are clean, the market is going to be dirty. So also here we have two sides of the metal, it seems to be. And we are in kind of a transition, not only to new energy, renewables, because I thought yesterday was one guy in the room dealing with renewables, I don't know if he is still here, if so, I, he would raise his voice if possible. We also have to incorporate renewables, that's true, but we also see kind of new market models, and we are dealing it from today. So the panelists which we have here, I hope we can speak about it. I never heard the word yesterday of decentralized energy production. It's, it's imminent, I think, also in the UK as well in, the, in, in Holland. It has its impact also on the big companies who are playing with the energy market. So I'm looking forward to the debate. We have two speakers in front, where we start with, and then we have a question to you, several questions to you. You will take care of that. We will see the votes, and we will ask your opinion, and we will ask also the opinion of the panels. So I think we will start with the first speaker. Please announce the first speaker if you want. Thank you very much, Mr. Grieving. Uh, so I'd like to provide a word to Sebastian Groblinhoff, and with the presentation, European Gas Hubs Towards Full Market Integration. Please, the first presentation. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting us to this, uh, to this panel and giving us the opportunity to address this distinct group of people. Um, well, Herr, thanks for the short introduction, and I think you, you covered quite a number of points, and you said um, we have to consider the past, the present, and the future. And I'll, I'll try to do exactly this in my, in my short presentation about European gas hubs. So I'll have a short look on the, on the past, how these um, hubs essentially developed, and I'll also try um, to give a very brief outlook what might happen in the future. Uh, there is a very famous proverb, I think it was by Mark Twain, who said, you know, um, making projections is really difficult, particularly when you make projections about the future. Um, so, but that, that's probably part also of our business, you know, times have become very, very dynamic, and um, for us, it's important to, to try to find ways to deal with the uncertainty. Um, so it will definitely be a discussion afterwards where things will be heading. Uh, but I'll try to give some input into this. Um, let us first have a quick look um, where we come from. And let us look at the general development of natural gas hubs in Europe. Um, while today natural gas hubs and exchanges form an integral part of the European energy market, 15 years ago, there was only two gas hubs in Northwest Europe. Supported by governments, back then, national gas markets were rather dominated by either one large market incumbent or only very few market players. Interconnections between the different national markets were almost non-existent, and gas pricing was mainly based on oil and coal product indexations, and these oil and coal product indexations were attached to long-term gas supply contracts. What was lacking at that time was a single transparent price signal which was accessible for all market actors. 
driven by the early market opening and liberalization policies of the UK government in the early 90s and the first EU gas directive in 1998, continental European gas markets slowly opened themselves to more competition. The introduction of third party access, meaning the possibility for other players in the market to access transport systems at the beginning of the millennium was certainly one of the key elements in breaking down the traditional market structures. Subsequently, new players entered the scene and they pushed for the establishment of trading hubs where gas could be bought and sold based on a transparent and reliable <coughs> price signal. Well, what happened next was that step by step and fueled by this further EU and national legislation, gas hubs were established essentially all over Europe and all over the place. With the advent of publicly available price signals for different prices between individual or the different prices between individual markets became more transparent and apparent and created incentives for a stronger interconnection and physical integration of markets. Because the, the price signal, of course, when you see that there are different prices, higher prices in one market, lower prices in other markets, you try to somehow make use of the opportunities from arbitraging between these markets. Um, the chart shows the convergence of prices um, of the months ahead product for deliveries at four major European hubs over time. And what you can see quite nicely is while in 2005 there were quite some significant price differences, um, these price differences completely vanished over the last couple of years. And the reason for this was that physical infrastructure was extended. And one, one very uh, good example is the bidirectional BBL pipeline that was built between the UK and continental Europe. So you could transport gas from the UK to the continent and the other way around, giving you the opportunity to arbitrage between different prices on the continent and in the UK. During the last years, we have to say that um, the gas hub prices gradually solidified their position and importance. In several key European gas markets, transparent hub prices have even fully replaced the traditional oil product indexation as the dominant pricing signal. So when, when we, for instance, are in touch with our customers, um, they look at the prices which are quoted at the hubs because this is a transparent price signal that they can revert to, that they can look at. And the, the pricing system that we used to have in the past in the more closed markets with long-term contracts being indexed to oil and coal, uh, they have been essentially replaced by these new price signals. When you look at recent press headings, um, there seems to be little doubt the overall importance of gas trading hubs in exchanges continues to grow. And I personally believe it's a trend that we can't stop. So I expect that we will not see a way back into the old world. Um, the big question for us is, will we see a full market integration in Europe? Uh, and will we see one single price signal for Europe? So will we have one big gas hub in Europe and one price signal for whole continental Europe or even for, for Europe uh, extending to, towards the boundaries. So will there be one essential big price signal? Well, let's, let's have a look at the, at, the different, uh, at the different hubs in Europe. And you can see that as of today, the development status and the function of the existing gas hubs still vary strongly. Uh, we have less developed hubs, um, which are still limited to fulfilling a balancing function within, uh, within their markets. And there's a relatively low level of liquidity. That means there's not so much volumes that are traded at these hubs. And you have the more advanced hubs, which allow you to provide a full range of trading products with high liquidity. And it also allows market participants to really pursue sophisticated trading and risk management strategies. Um, when comparing, for example, traded volumes based on the churn ratio, so that means how many times physical volumes are in a way traded. Um, and it, it's, it's essentially expressing the relations of volume traded to the actual physical deliverance, deliveries. There still is a significant difference between the markets. And you can see I, I picked the three biggest one, uh, the, national, the national balancing point in the UK, the tidal transfer facility in the Netherlands, and the, the leading German hub, the NCG. You see that there's still some difference between 
these individual markets. Um, anyway, without doubt, the development of gas hubs and exchanges is one driving force towards an integrated European gas market. However, the different degrees of market opening in individual EU member states, as well as the sluggish development of physical interconnections in some regions, still represent a major obstacle to a true and fully integrated European gas market. Despite the ongoing effort of the EU policies and institutions, a single European gas market with only one price quoted at one European single hub, to my mind, will not be seen in the near future. So what we will see is we will see extended trading activities, we will see the attempt to increase the interconnectivity between markets, but the way towards one single European gas market with one single price signal uh, is not to be expected in the near future. Um, so that's, uh, that's probably a short uh, introduction into what we've seen in the past, where we are at the present, and a very short and brief outlook um, to the future. I'm open to questions in the discussion. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you for the information that you have prepared uh, for all the statistical and analytical materials. I think that all the audience uh, uh, will be prepared uh, a few questions. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I suggest you to have one more presentation, and then we will be ready to answer all the questions that you'll have in your mind. So I give a word to Elena Rinalda Castera, please. Presentation number two. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I will tell you something about the role of prices in gas, uh, gas trading on the hubs and the importance of prices. Uh, let me first introduce a little bit about my company, Gasterra. Uh, we are a gas trading company based in the Netherlands. Our supplies come mainly from the Dutch domestic production and a small amount of imports. We export gas and we sell gas on the Dutch market to, for example, energy distribution companies and industries. And, of course, we sell gas on the hubs, like the Dutch TTF. Um, I'll briefly introduce gas hubs and how gas is traded on these hubs. Um, the most physical infrastructure is regulated by governments within the European Union, and um, if at least in Western European. Uh, the trade of gas is free on a free market. Um, Gas can be delivered on different hubs where the hub price is paid. And gas can be transported through different countries via exit and entry points where also transport fees are paid. Uh, this graph shows you uh, the amount of gas which is delivered on the hubs with regard to the total amount of energy demand in Western, European, Western Europe. As you can see, this amount is growing and by now it's almost 80% of all the gas that is delivered on hubs. And we believe that this will become 100% in the near future. Also, the gas which is not delivered on the hubs, the prices are linked to the hub prices, so the impact of uh, hub prices is almost 100%. Um, the markets uh, in Western Europe are very liquid. There are many players, many transactions. You can buy standardized products. You can buy gas for a year, for a season, a month, etc. Uh, which creates a very trusted and accepted price for the gas. And there is, therefore, there is gas-to-gas -gas competition and gas-to-gas -gas pricing in Western Europe. Uh, this slide shows you an example of the many players which are in the European market. Uh, the different colors stand for different sources of origin of the gas. You can see that's a lot. And there's not really one price setter because of that. This slide also gives you an indication of where the gas supplies are coming from. Uh, this slide was also slightly in the previous presentation. It shows you the monthly average month ahead prices on four very important hubs uh, in Europe, the Dutch TTF, uh, British MBP, and the German uh, NCG and gas pool. 
you can see prices are more or less becoming the same, uh, which means uh, supply and demand in Europe is being balanced, and there's full gas-to-gas -gas competition. It's the law of one price. And to say another time, it's price that matters. And here's an example of that for uh, power generation. It's the cost prices for gas and coal for the same amount of electricity. Right now, of course, you can see coal is much cheaper and therefore power is being generated by coal. And power generation often switches depending on what's the cheapest resource to generate electricity. This, also, this mechanism also uh, goes for LNG. If the price is right, LNG can come, and uh, if demand is low, price is low, it won't come. That's uh, the importance of the price. Well, let's sum up very short the most important conclusions of this uh, brief story. We believe the market soon will be 100% spot-based. Uh, the law of one price is applicable in Western Europe. It's a matter of price, and we believe that prices are more and more important than politics and geopolitics. That was my presentation. Thank you. We have questions in the room. Who is one want to make the first question? Come on. Nobody? Pick Nobody? One. Just pick one. We pick one. So or a volunteer or we pick one. <laughs> No, nobody, everybody, everybody is understanding that the market is getting extremely liquid, that people can buy what they want, and consumers don't care where it comes from, except the politicians. We have one question here, one volunteer. Uh, basically, what uh, makes you uh, estimate that it will be a 100% uh, delivery through hubs in the near future, which you mentioned? Uh, thank you. Uh, we believe that markets are becoming more and more important to, uh, to balance su supply and demand in Western Europe. Infrastructure is getting better and better. Um, hub prices will be more important and also uh, be a basis for all prices. So we believe that it will become 100% or at least almost 100%. I think what you also said was even if it is 80%, the, the prices will yeah. be 100% already linked to gas to gas competition. So it doesn't matter if you still have some long-term contracts on a, on a special location, the price will be linked to the price of tomorrow, whatever it is. So be welcome in the casino. Are there more questions? Uh, we have one more comment for the previous one question from Constantin. A short comment on that, why do we believe that if you look in the markets, the more interconnections you have, for example, from Germany to Austria to Hungary. In the past, there was a certain price level in Austria and a certain price level in Germany. The closer the markets got, there was actually no plus. In the past, it was hub price Germany plus transport to Austria. Today, it's more or less the same, the hub prices. And this is like if you now go further to Hungary, it's going into the same direction that they go to the level of the Austrians. So the better the interconnection is between the market, the less arbitrage opportunities you have. Uh, my name is Anastasia Goriva. I'm from Petroleum Argos. Uh, my question is the following. Um, you say that um, and consumers do not care where the gas will come from, except of politicians. But uh, uh, could anyone um, sort of prioritize who will who actually dictates the market in Europe uh, and consumers, politicians who somehow uh, in care where the gas will come from, um, investors who must invest into interconnectors to make the market more liquid, or um, gas sellers. Um, how would you put these priorities? <laughs> Thank you. Maybe Ellen can answer that because we just recently finished off a university investigation of all the data 2011-2013 on, on economics. She can tell it, but maybe also somebody in the panel. First Ellen, and then you won. Yeah. Come on. Um, well, I think it's uh, what, what 
probably some European politicians uh, tend to underestimate and, and which is also not always clear to, to customers, to end customers. When you look at gas supplies to Europe, um, we are more than 80-85% import dependent. So we do get our gas not from indigenous production, so not from production with this, which is with, within Europe. And the number of suppliers around us um, is limited. It became larger um, due to technologies like uh, the possibility to liquefy natural gas and to transport it and to offer it on economic terms. Um, but it's, it's in a way, you know, the, the, the choice and the options that we do have in Europe uh, is limited. So it's, it's not a question of, um, okay, th there might be political motivations to say there's one supplier that I prefer this time, but what will remain uh, as, a, as a general situation is that the number of suppliers remains limited. And when you look around Europe, um, Russia always has been one of our key suppliers, and I'm quite sure it will remain one of our key suppliers. Um, you have Norway that, that has been a strong supplier. We have the Netherlands, which, which is counted as indigenous production. Um, so these are the key supply sources for Europe. Uh, there is the idea to extend uh, and to, to tap into new uh, areas where we can, can source gas. Um, there is a lot of discussion about the north of Africa, but uh, if you look at the political situation, big question. Uh, apart from that, a lot of the new production that we see in that region is uh, is going into the region itself because these regions are also developing. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure, you know, if, if this is really um, a question of choice or a big choice and where we have our priorities. Okay. A lady in a second. I mean, the companies who, who invest into, integrate into interconnectors, are they somehow can influence this uh, situation? Or is your answer that a supplier, an end consumer, uh, dictates the market, but not the politicians? That, that politicians play the, do not, in fact, play any role. Um, well, that's that's indeed for investors. Of course, it's it's one of the key questions: is um, does it make sense for me uh, to enter into one of these very capital-intensive projects? So, if you build a pipeline, um, I mean, there's there's Nord Stream Two, which now has been uh, announced as a new project. I mean, this is a project um, which is around seven, eight, nine billion euros worth. So if you, if you want to make this investment, of course, as an investor, you want to have some certainty um, that your gas can be sold and that it can be sold in, on economic terms. And that is a very big discussion because people say, okay, do, do uh, the, the, the markets that we see today, do they provide this sustainable price signal? Um, well, you know, that's the market that we have to deal with. And on the one hand, it's understandable that investors want to have the certainty of a, of a price level that allows them to make that investment. On the other hand, uh, we have, or the European politicians have opted for a system um, that might lead to some more price volatility, and that, that can have an effect that we see more cycles. Yeah? You will see probably cycles of uh, higher prices because there's less demand in the market. Um, then investors might be inclined to invest more because they see, they see the higher price. You will see some more supply coming into the market, prices coming down, then it's less attractive. Um, we have seen that in other markets, the oil market. Yeah? You, you will probably see more cyclical business and it will probably be more cyclical than it used to be in the past where we had this strong relationship uh, via long-term contracts. Uh, my name is Julia Birenstein, National Mineral Resources University, Mining University, St. Petersburg. Uh, my question is connected with the previous one. Uh, I would like to know uh, what type of gas is interested, uh, uh, European hubs are interested in. Uh, will it be pipeline gas or LNG gas? Uh, what to, I think that that's a question that, that, that can be yeah that's, that can be answered quite quite uh, quite quickly because it will depend on the price. So you know um, traders at the at, at at a hub they don't ask if the if the gas is coming through a pipe or if it if it comes uh, on an LNG ship. They only look at the price and they will also always go for the option that is uh, from an economic perspective the most advantageous for them. So and it, it will in the future be a competition which is fully and solely based on price. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, four more very interesting presentations. So let's continue. Have in mind your questions to 
have in mind the question that uh, you have, and we will return to them. And now, uh, we also prepared one question for you. Uh, the students have uh, some special technical devices to vote for the question that we prepare for you. So please look on the screen. You have one minute to answer the question you see on the screen and vote for the answer. Please take your time and begin voting. So in English, is, is the natural gas business a political issue or more or less a business influenced by economic issues? More or less the questions which we already were answering, trying to answer, now it's up to you to say A for yes or no for B. And if it's, it's hard, to, hard to answer, it may be C. We have some results. Okay, stop voting. Yes, Rizuta. Just uh, one and a half of the second and the results are on the screen. <laughs> A is a winner. <laughs> yes, so it means that yes, it's, it's connected. And I ask, kindly ask our experts to comment the results of our students. What do you think on each? Please, Constantin. I think it's something in between. I'm a lawyer, I will always say it depends <laughs> by education. But in the end, it's a business, and in business you have to earn money. It's a commercial question. Like, like Sebastian said, if you plan to invest in a pipeline, you want to get a certain return. If you put <laughs> 7, 9 billion euro into the Baltic Sea, you want to know I get back money on a yearly basis, I get back what I invested, and I on top earn something. So my answer would have been something in between. It's economic business influenced by politics, by politics and highly influenced by today's regulation by the EU, which does not make it easier to have a solely commercial approach. Thank you it's very something much. Something between yes and no. <laughs> thank you very much for comment. Mr. Virabian, I saw you put a hand. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I think that um, uh, the reply maybe reflects that you are students and you have your information from your universities, uh, from newspapers, uh, from television, and there are a lot of uh, political aspects when we are looking for this. But uh, when you are business, I completely agree with my colleague that um, uh, maybe replying also to your questions uh, uh, concerning uh, the role of politics, investors, and the market. Market is regulated by supply and demand, and supply and demand regulate the markets first. There is for sure political aspects, for sure, but mainly in business, uh, I have partners uh, here in panel, and I, I see some partners in uh, between you. Uh, when we are discussing, our main idea is please leave business to make business, and please don't introduce a lot of politics, uh, because for us it's barriers. It's not helping us uh, to move in our business. When we are discussing our contracts, we are discussing on the basis of uh, markets, each market where contracts are signed, and mainly we are discussing not political aspects, but we are discussing where is supply, where is the demand, and where is the right price. Thank you very much for the very complete and interesting answer. And uh, any other expert who would like to comment the results? If no, I'd like to provide the word to the next speaker. Uh, please, Ross McWay, um, the topic of the presentation, evolution and potential expansion of gas hubs. The third presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the, the time uh, to let me to come and talk to you. I I'm work at Gazprom Marketing and Trading. Uh, we're a team sort of based in London, but we have offices around the world. Um, that we primarily look at the trading aspect of, of the natural gas world. I'll probably start with a bit of an apology. Um, in the gas industry, we're very bad on the use of the word hub. Um, a hub is essentially just a point in space that's defined. It can be virtual or it can be physical. Uh, for example, 
one of the most famous gas hubs around for trading is the Henry Hub in the United States, but that is based in a small town of Erath in, um, in Texas. It only has a population of about 2,500 people. So the location isn't really the, uh, the, the main point. It's just the fact it gives a, a place where you can actually trade gas. So what I'm going to talk about here is actually the trading gas aspect. Initially, I look back at the European expansion, and then if we get time towards the end, maybe looking at the global perspective of the gas market. In a similar slide to Sebastian Slode's at the start time, 10 years ago, the, the trading gas market in Europe was very small. It was primarily based around the United Kingdom at the national balancing point. That was the first gas hub trading established in Europe in about 1996. And those small amounts of trading at Zeebrug in Belgium, and also, it, although it wasn't called the TTF at the time, um, it, it was um, based in the Netherlands. In the past 10 years, we've seen about a six times increase in the trading volume and the expansion of gas hubs throughout uh, Northwest Europe. At the same time, we've seen demands come down. So we're now looking at a situation where each molecule of gas within the European market is traded about eight times before it goes to delivery. This is uh, even in respect to the fact that most of the trading is actually done in the West. The, TT, the MBP is still the largest single gas market in Europe, um, whereas the TTF in the Netherlands has seen a, a very large increase in, in the amount of volume. And we've seen some more hubs develop, particularly two in Germany. There is two in France, but uh, we, we only managed to get data for, for a single point. And then some trading within Italy and, uh, and also Austria. Looking forward, um, we're probably expecting a further increase in expansion of the number of hubs, um, primarily through Central Europe and into Eastern Europe. And then we also have the situation with the Iberian Peninsula. At the moment, Iberia is a market very much influenced by supplies from, uh, from North Africa, but mainly from liquefied natural gas or LNG. So because of this lack of physical interconnection between Iberia and France, we see Spain actually trading as, a, as quite an isolated system. However, there is talk of more interconnection uh, that will actually bring the Spanish market and the availability of LNG more into the Western markets. The countries shaded in blue are actually quite liberalized markets. We have um, quite a degree of trading within them and there is um, regulation in place to allow free access to, to the gas. The countries in orange are, do have the regulation in place to allow trading. They have open entry exit zones, so essentially people can move gas between the, uh, the zone, and there is some trading in respect to, to the um, Northwest European hubs. The countries in grey um, are very much in the developmental stage. Uh, they haven't got the required regulation in place uh, to actually enable the, 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 the development of hubs. And for a lot of the markets, they're actually too small to actually stimulate enough trading. So what we're actually seeing is the fact that we may get some regional hubs there. Uh, so we might get a southern eastern Europe hub or a, a hub up in the Baltic as well. Conceptionally, how the hubs actually work is that they actually try and balance supply and demand. Uh, the chart on the left-hand side shows the situation in 2013, where into Northwest Europe we had the, the main supplies coming from the Norwegian pipe, Russian pipe, and North African pipe. Then um, what we've, uh, we'll, we'll actually have is movement of the gas through the various hubs to match the supply and demand. Over on top of this, we will also have uh, the indigenous production and interaction with storage, so it's a bit more of a dynamic system. The LNG that's actually coming into this picture is um, probably the biggest flexibility or unknown within this picture. It was talked about earlier in terms of security of uh, supply into the market. The LNG is very much uh, directed by the global markets. So in 2013, the year there, we actually had very low LNG deliveries into the markets as there was a lot more demand for the gas within the Asian markets. However, with new LNG supply coming in the system, we're likely to see more LNG available to the European market. So that LNG will come into the European market if the price is, is the biggest. And one of the questions earlier was the, what was the preferential source of gas. And essentially, the LNG is available to the market. And if the European market pays the highest price, then LNG will become available. On the chart on the right, I've taken just one gas year from October 2012 till um, September 2013. 
to show that the gas markets are generally a lot more variable than existing longer term supply contracts. The solid lines there are indicating some proxy of an oil index contract, whereas the gas markets on the day ahead will respond a lot to the local supply and demand. In this example, the MBP, the UK, will generally import gas from the continent in the winter, so the MBP will have a higher price than the continental um, markets, whereas in the summer, uh, the MBP there, the UK, will generally export into, into the continental market, so you'll generally see a lower MBP price. Because it's a lot more responsive to local supply demand positions, we had a very large um, price increase in around March 2013 because we had a very cold period of winter uh, come in when the market, the storage was actually quite low and so the market increased in price. That had the response of attracting LNG that came in from Qatar to actually satisfy the, the, the local sort of position. Just in terms of the, the global perspective on, in terms of gas hubs, we've very much talked about uh, the European hubs. They are growing in volume, deliveries and number. Um, the best known market is the Henry Hub in the United States. However, there are multiple markets within the United States and the Henry Hub is the, most, the biggest pricing point but not the biggest volume. Uh, Dominion South um, near the Marcellus Field is the biggest traded volume. The Henry Hub and the MBP used to trade very close to each other, um, but then the, the US found how to activate shale gas, and what we were seeing is the fact that the, the price of the gas in the United States has come off a lot and continues to go lower. The, the United States are actually getting better at drilling in the shale, and so the, the, the gas is getting cheaper. The Asian spot market, uh, shown here in JKM, isn't a traded market at this moment in time. It's a price indication. So we cannot buy or sell gas in the Asian spot market. Um, so what we actually said is that the Asian price was very close to the other prices prior to Fukushima and the tsunami that hit Japan. With the closure of the nuclear power plants, uh, the demand for gas within Asia went up a lot and we started to see Asia having to pay a lot of money to get access to the gas. This took gas away from the European market, so we, we had lower amounts of LNG. What that actually stimulated, because it's a high price environment, a lot of people took investment decisions to, to start building new supply projects. And we're starting to see those new supply projects uh, becoming uh, active. And so what, what we're actually starting to see is the price of gas in Asia has come down again. And we're starting to see a lot more interaction between the European markets and the Asian markets. Going forward, this interaction will likely grow. Um, a lot of new LNG supplies are actually going to be indexed to the Henry Hub price, or LNG suppliers are looking to actively trade in the European markets. But there's been a lot of talk about whether we'll actually see Asian hubs develop. Um, and I think the short answer is it's not going to be a short time. But certainly within the career of those in the room, that if you come into the gas industry, you'll certainly start seeing some Asian gas markets develop. Uh, they have some logistics and, um, and other problems to solve. But I think within the next five to ten years, we'll see markets within Asia. Thank you. Um. Thank you, uh, Scott. Um, one question on, on one of your slides, you had a gray area. I think it was the Balkan region. Um, which is not sufficient with, with pipelines and neither hubs, neither connections. Everything is failing. What should be, in your view, should be done from a European perspective in order to have this gray area more connected? Well, I, I, I think it comes down to, to two aspects. One is the regulation aspect. Uh, they need to be able to get the, the transmission service operators to communicate to allow free access between the markets. Then there is actually some infrastructure projects that are required, particularly to connect the Balkans up to the more liquid western markets. And there's a few interconnectors uh, that are being announced, um, one, one by EU Stream that's actually looking at giving the, the Balkan region more access to the western market. And once there is actually more diversity of supply, I think that's going to be the big trigger for setting up the, the trading markets. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, are we allowing one question? Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's have a question maybe from the student. Is, is, is a question special to all these uh, virtual uh, business, paper, paper, but this is the way it works. I think if you're asking consumers, which you already are asking, oh yeah, <laughs> 
if, if consumers are really interested in certain, uh, in certain issues, uh, um, what we see is indeed the consumer doesn't care where it comes from. He neither cares how long it is available because he, he believes that it will be also there tomorrow. So the market is propelled by the consumers. Where it comes from, we don't care. We buy just what we need and that's it. So that's a complete different way of dealing with the market than we had in the past. Please. Uh, Dmitry from Gupkin Russian State University of Oil and Gas. Uh, you talk about uh, gas haps as a physical storage, uh, but uh, do you have some haps or information about haps like uh, a virtual point? Thank you. Yeah, um, the, when I was talking about the, the storage is that the price signals in the hub uh, give um, a big indication about how companies should, should actually use storage when they, they look at actually injecting into the hubs or, or withdrawing it out of the hubs. The, the virtual point, most of the gas hubs in Europe, um, I think there's only one left that's a physical point in space. They're all virtual hubs. Um, so if you get, uh, for example, if you import gas into the Netherlands, essentially you are at the TTF, so you can arrange delivery and trading at that, at that point. So um, there is a big move um, within Europe that all the hubs are actually going to be just virtual points of space, much like in the oil market where, where essentially if you look at Brent, uh, the, the, everyone knows the Brent contract, that has a virtual point of, um, it, it's, it's got a delivery location, but very few cargoes actually come to that physical location. It's just a reference point they can actually use to trade around it. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question from the students? You see that our discussion provoked uh, the questions even uh, through the experts, so between the experts we are very happy. Uh, so in this case, let's continue our uh, uh, discussion and with pleasure I provide a word to the president of Gazprom Marketing Trading France, Mr. Virabian. Большое спасибо. Я представляю компанию Gazprom Marketing Trading. Это стопроцентная зарубежная точка Газпрома. Я коллега Роса. Рос работает в лондонском офисе, я в парижском. Компания международная. У нас работает много-много различных национальностей, больше 25. Основными рабочими языками у нас являются русский и английский. Я буду говорить здесь на русском языке. Может быть, несколько слов о себе. Для вас, может быть, интересно, для студентов. Я закончил МГИМО. После этого несколько лет посвятил научной работе в Институте Африки, Академии наук, в секторе арабских стран, поскольку в Институте был первый арабский язык, поэтому занимался именно в этом, в этом секторе. И э, работал по э, энергетическому сектору, энергетической промышленности в Алжире. В результате я заинтересовался энергетикой и э, начал работу в «Газпроме». Сначала в «Газпром экспорте», потом э, в ГМТ, ГМТ сокращение «Газпром Аркет Трейдинг», в ГМТ Франции в Париже. Э, э, я буду говорить сегодня о э, другом виде деятельности, в отличие от моих коллег, которые рассказывали о трейдинге, о биржах. Кстати, могу вам сказать, что это очень интересная сфера. По общению наше со студентами мы понимаем, что в наших вузах может быть еще недостаточно внимания этому сегменту, подготовки специалистам в этой области. И мы готовы оказать нашу поддержку университетам и специалистами, и тренингам. Я считаю, что это очень интересная сфера, особенно для молодежи, тех, кто любит определенный риск, взвешенный риск. Но надо готовить специалистов, мы заинтересованы в специалистах, в том числе в российских, из ваших вузов. Я буду говорить о продажах конечным потребителям, поскольку работаю в компании ГМТ Франция, которая занимается именно этим видом деятельности на французском рынке. Мы считаем в «Газпроме», что этот сегмент важный для группы, Важный элемент всей цепочки. «Газпром» имеет полную цепочку, начиная от добычи газа, транспортировки по российской территории, транзита по Европе и продажи конечным потребителям. Различные виды деятельности, такие как… И у нас в «Газпроме» есть весь портфель. В основном это и главное – это долгосрочные контракты. Помимо этого мы работаем на торговых площадках, то, что сегодня вот, о чем Рос говорил. 
мы работаем на различных биржах, и мы также работаем на рынке конечного потребления. Специфика работы на рынке конечного потребления заключается в том, что когда поставляется газ по долгосрочным контрактам, то газ идет тем же самым объемом ежедневно. Конечный потребитель требует большой гибкости, поскольку зависит от профиля, Бывают потребители, которые зависят от температуры, бывают от производства. Но в любом случае он должен иметь возможность иметь гибкость, либо ничего не брать, либо брать 100%, а иногда брать и больше, чем 100% по контрактов. Для этого мы используем торговые площадки, для этого мы используем трейдинг в том числе, дополняем долгосрочные контракты, тем, тем, таким образом имеем возможность поставлять, модулировать наши поставки газа, поставлять конечным потребителям тот продукт, который, который им требуется. Несколько слов так, сейчас, секундочку. Несколько слов о нашей компании. Компания «Газпром Маркет Трейдинг» в рамках «Газпрома» занимается широким профилем продуктов. В нашем портфеле есть как трубопроводный природный газ, так и жиженный природный газ, электроэнергия, сертификаты выбросов, различные новые товары, как гели и другие товары, которые сопровождают добычу природного газа, а также такие товары, как СУГ и другие товары. Что касается собственности и управления компанией, то мы, как я уже говорил, являемся стопроцентной точкой «Газпрома». Через «Газпром Экспорт», «Газпром Германии» и дальше работаем в, в, нескольких, в нескольких продуктовых областях, а также в географиях. Я непосредственно занимаюсь французским рынком в рамках нашей компании. Так, я пошел обратно. Этот слайд посвящен вопросам спроса предложений производства в Европе. Вчера говорилось об этом, в том числе выступление Алексея Борисовича Миллера, о том, что по прогнозам ожидается определенный рост спроса на природный газ в Европе. К сожалению, последние годы этот спрос мы констатировали больше стагнации. Но по прогнозам всех ведущих компаний и научных центров в предстоящие годы намечается рост спроса. При этом одновременно мы являемся свидетелями снижения добычи на европейском континенте. Я могу назвать, может быть, две цифры вам назову. Это то, что к 2025 году в Европе потребуется как минимум 152 миллиарда дополнительных объемов газа, а к 35-му году 212 миллиардов. Говорит о том, что Европа заинтересована в получении импортного газа, и «Газпром» сегодня играет важную роль на этом рынке. Мы считаем, что природный газ играет и будет играть важную роль, в том числе на европейском рынке. В таких новых областях, как использование газа, как газомоторное топливо, вопрос активно сейчас обсуждается, вчера много раз поднимался на форуме. Я сталкивался с такими вопросами, недавно у нас была встреча с французским регулятором, который задал вопрос, что вы думаете о газе как газомоторном топливе. Мы сказали, что видим большое будущее, на что мы получили в ответ ну, понятно, вы работаете в газовой компании, вам за это платят, поэтому вы пробиваете газ. Но если мы забудем, где мы работаем, кто в каких компаниях работает, то мы видим действительно много позитивных моментов, которые дает газ, как газомоторное топливо. Чистое, чистое топливо имеется в наличии. Наверное, основной проблемой, которая сегодня обсуждается, это инвестиции, в газозаправочные станции, которых действительно не хватает. Также вот на одном форуме в Париже было обсуждение вокруг газомоторного топлива, и один из потребителей газа встал и сказал, в принципе, я за, но вопрос в том, что в парижском регионе всего три заправки, 
ну как я могу со своим автомобилем э, покупать газовый автомобиль, если всего три заправки. Э, и, конечно, это создает проблему. Сегодня в, это, в этот сегмент требуются инвестиции. Мы, как «Газпром», тоже изучаем различные проекты в европейских странах. Э, важную роль, мы надеемся, газ будет играть э, в производстве электроэнергии на так называемых станциях, комбинированных станциях CCGT. К сожалению, опять же, в последние годы мы наблюдаем кризис в этом сегменте, связанный в целом с кризисом экономическим. Мы считаем, что тем не менее в будущем место для газа в электроэнергии важное. Связано это с тем, что когда Европа говорит о том, что возобновляемые виды энергии имеют важную роль и все больше и больше будет внимания возобновляемым энергии, видам энергии, электростанции на газе являются важным элементом, сопутствующим развитию возобновляемых. Поскольку когда нет солнца и нет ветра, то газовые станции являются альтернативой самой интересной. Они быстро запускаются, их можно быстро остановить. Как я уже говорил, газ э, чистое топливо э, имеется в наличии, и мы считаем конкурентоспособное по сравнению с остальными. Поэтому мы считаем, что э, этот сегмент будет также развиваться. Э, кстати, вот э, могу отметить как парадокс э, германский случай. Мы знаем, что в Германии достаточно сильная власть зеленых, и зеленые актив, играют активную роль. Э, при этом одновременно мы наблюдаем рост потребления угла, угля для производства электроэнергии, то есть электростанции продолжают дымить, используя уголь. Вот. Мы считаем, это временный элемент. Да, действительно, сегодня уголь дешевый. Вот. Но, тем не менее, это временный элемент. И в будущем все-таки газ будет заменять уголь в производстве электроэнергии. Что касается либерализации рынки, рынка и европейского законодательства, наверное, остановлюсь только на одном сегменте, потому, поскольку тема достаточно широкая. На сегменте либерализации рынки конечного потребителя действительно для нас это важный элемент, и «Газпром» выступает как новый поставщик на этом рынке. Как это ни странно для России, где «Газпром» играет другую роль, то на, на, для, на европейских рынок, на рынках «Газпром» является новым поставщиком. На данном слайде показаны те игроки, которые сегодня на французском рынке выступают. Все больше и больше новых поставщиков. В основном исторические поставщики начали работать в сегменте крупных промышленностей, где, наверное, легче всего было войти на этот рынок. И сегодня все больше и больше поставщиков идет в рынок мелких потребителей. Не так много пока, около 25 поставщиков работают в сегменте бытовом. Вот вы видите с левой стороны, это те, кто работают в сегменте бытовых потребителей. Здесь основную роль играют исторические поставщики. Здесь еще старое название ЖДФ Суэц, я извиняюсь перед моим коллегой. Сегодня компания называется NG. NG DF это два исторических поставщика. Один добавил в свой портфель электричество, другой добавил газ. Сегодня активно конкурируют друг с другом на обеих рынках. Мы работаем, вы видите, Газпром Энергии в сегменте, пока не работаем в сегменте бытовом, работаем в сегменте крупных промышленностей, средней и мелкой промышленности. Могу, может быть, сказать две цифры по нашей деятельности во Франции. Начали в 2007 году, получив лицензию, первые контракты с крупными промышленными потребителями. В 2011 году мы вышли на сегмент среднего и мелкого потребления газа. Сегодня мы имеем в нашем портфеле около 2000 клиентов с 6000 пунктов сдачи газа. В нашем портфеле около 1 миллиарда газа, который мы подаем конечным потребителям, что добавляется к долгосрочным контрактам с НЖ, где объемы значительно больше. Рынок очень интересный, рынок крупной промышленности сегодня конкурентоспособный, много поставщиков, в основном работаем на базе тендеров. Среди клиентов могу назвать регион Альзас, где мы недавно подписали глобальное соглашение по поставкам газа на учебные заведения в этом регионе. Город Нант, могу назвать также Ряд конечных потребителей, таких как магазины «Ашан», как гаражи ряда производителей автомобилей, таких как «Мерседес», «Ауди» и так далее. Много других клиентов. 
Наиболее активность у нас на севере Франции. Французский энергетический рынок разделен сегодня на три зоны. И переход с газа из одной зоны в другой требует оплаты транзитной, достаточно дорогой. Наш газ российский поступает на север Франции, поэтому у нас основные позиции, основные потребители в этом сегменте, в этой энергетической зоне. Несколько слов о работе с конечными потребителями. Во Франции ситуация складывается таким образом, что до последнего времени, до открытия рынка был один поставщик, и поэтому не было большого интереса. У тебя был тариф, который регулировал цену, у тебя был один счет в месяц, и никакого интереса интересоваться не было, потому что ты платил тот счет, который к тебе приходил. Когда рынок открылся, то это было неожиданностью для многих, особенно мелких потребителей, которые просто не знали функционирования рынка. И мы вместе с другими новыми поставщиками, «Газпром» сегодня, помимо всего прочего, мы проводим сервисное обслуживание наших клиентов, объясняя клиентам, что такое газ, как он функционирует, как функционирует рынок, как формируются цены. Это абсолютно необходимое сопровождение наших контрактов и те, кто лучше это делают, имеют преимущество у конечных потребителей. Ну, в завершение мне хотелось бы сказать, что э, мы рассчитываем на то, что э, рынок э, будет развиваться, э, рынок будет конкурентоспособный, и «Газпром» будет занимать достойное место на этих рынках. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation and I hope that uh, our students have questions for the topic so we one are waiting there? your hands I see one hand over there Please. I just had an answer to uh, to you I, you you were talking about coal producing lignite I saw just that Greenpeace is willing to buy one of the lignite factories in Germany in order to close it so also here is a matter of price <laughs> Thank you Uh, Frederik Reimann from the University Duisburg Essen in Germany. Uh, I have a question concerning the NGV market. You pointed out the growing importance of NGV, but uh, the current lack of infrastructure. So, what, in your opinion, is the strategy to improve the infrastructure with, with regard to the consumer demand? Would you suggest to actively give incentives or just trust on the political incentives? Uh, I, I think it uh, depends on the countries. Um, in some countries, uh, we still need a lot of uh, political support. For example, in France, definitely, uh, we are speaking a lot with the ministry, uh, with banks, with investors, that in our uh, projects we really need support uh, of investors uh, to build uh, necessary infrastructure, what I told you before. Uh, in the same time, uh, we need also uh, uh, the suppliers to be interested in this kind of, uh, of markets. And we see that more and more uh, suppliers is uh, uh, entering this market. As you know, there is uh, 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 also LNG, which is uh, we plan to use uh, uh, in truck and uh, in bus or in bunkering also. And uh, you know that practically all uh, Uh, all the LNG terminals and all new uh, building LNG terminals now we uh, are equipped with installations for small sky LNG. It's for us it's very important because when today we are looking for this, we need to supply. And uh, a large gas supply, no problem. There are a lot of gas, you know, it's, uh, today market is really a buyer's market. Uh, but when I are speaking about small sky LNG, there is not sufficient supply for this. Uh, we are looking also that uh, uh, Gazprom also is looking to, to supply Russian gas in this, in this segment. Uh, but today we see that there are uh, all LNG installation is now equipped on this or starting to be equipped on this. And I, I think it will help us to develop this, uh, this activity in, in Europe. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question or are we going to head with our own question? One more question? Okay. You're right. Wait. Я по-русски задам. Евдокимова Вероника, Национальный минеральный сырьевой университет Горный. Как известно, на европейском рынке есть и другие поставщики газа, помимо России. Нет ли опасений, что в дальнейшем Европа, в частности Франция, даст предпочтение другим поставщикам? Uh, знаете, я вам так отвечу на ваш вопрос. 
на одном, на одном из форумов энергетических в Париже в течение утренней секции было сказано о том, что Европа должна, ну вы, наверное, слышали тоже это активно в прессе обсуждается, должна диверсифицироваться с точки зрения получения газа. И в этой связи Россия представляет опасность, занимает слишком большое место, поэтому надо дать определенный сегмент для России и дать возможность другим поставщикам, другим поставщикам поставлять свой, год, свой газ. А в секции, которая была после обеда, один из представителей, также французский лавок кругов, сказал о том, что ну как же так, «Газпром» диверсифицирует свою деятельность, стал активно выступать на азиатском рынке, подписал контракты с Китаем, так нельзя делать, надо «Газпром» оставить для Европы, иначе он уйдет из Европы. На что я ответил, вы как-то разберитесь между собой, нужен вам «Газпром» или не нужен. Мы считаем, что Европа диверсифицируется, мы ничего против этого не имеем, мы ничего не имеем против вхождения на эти рынки других поставщиков, есть традиционные поставщики, есть новые, которые приходят с жиженным природным газом. Мы также диверсифицируемся, как «Газпром», для нас очень важен становится азиатский рынок, китайский рынок, рынки других стран. При этом Европа остается стратегически важным рынком для нас. Исторически в течение 40 лет мы поставляли газ в Европу, продолжаем поставлять. Если вы поговорите с деловыми кругами, если вы поговорите с энергетическими компаниями, если вы поговорите с конечными потребителями, вам скажут, что мы заинтересованы в российском газе. Мы привыкли к российскому газу, нас полностью устраивает сложившаяся ситуация. Вот. Поэтому в этой связи я считаю, что для нас мы сегодня не видим каких-то критических опасностей для, для наших позиций. При этом, конечно, мы должны быть конкурентоспособными, конечно, мы должны работать над стратегией на этих рынках, изучать новые области применения, о том я еще сегодня говорил, и мы внимательно этим занимаемся, поэтому мы считаем, что для нашего газа есть место, и как есть газ для других поставщиков на этих рынках. And you saw the gap uh, you showed on your chart what we expect in additional demand in Europe. So the question is what politicians say sometimes is not linked to what the market can deliver. So if you say I don't like, like I understand some people said in Paris, I don't want more Russian gas, then the question is where else shall the gas come from if you see the gap in demand? And then there is only one alternative. It's not Norway, because Norway is at the limit. They will not produce much more than 110 BCM. Mm -hmm. Netherlands, UK, Germany, indigenous production is going down. So who can deliver it? Will it be Russia or LNG? And then again, it's a simple question in the end. Will it be LNG or Russia? It's a question of the price. And I think then the pipe gas from Russia is in a quite well position. If not politicians in Germany or in France or Europe decide, we're happy to pay an upside just to feel better, but then the consumers have to pay that, and I doubt that the Europeans are ready to do so. Price. There was one more question, I think. Yeah, I have seen one question from the student, I guess. You On have the back a side? question? Was one more? No? No more question? Okay, uh, we have a... You, you could sit in. And then you have a question. Uh, no, I have no. Thank you. Uh, Екатерина Кровецкая, I'm from Gazguni. I have a question to all uh, panel members, if I may. Um, what is, in your opinion, uh, if there are such a uh, liquid markets in Europe, they all work and function very well, and there's a GMT function on the markets on behalf of Gazprom uh, selling and buying uh, gas, natural gas on the hub, what then is the idea for this um, strategy of, to sell additional gas vo uh, volumes uh, via the auction mechanism? What is the idea about the auction mechanism. Why is it necessary for Gazprom uh, to use this uh, uh, sales uh, mechanism, you think? And, you know, what's your opinion about it? How do you think, uh, what was the strategy behind it from the Gazprom's point of view, but also from other market parties, perhaps? None of Paris. Paris? As I understood, you spoke to the auction, last auction which Gazprom organized in St. Petersburg, right? Yeah. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Merrill told about, about future plans that it is not uh, the only one uh, auction that uh, will organize new auctions and uh, 
The next one should be uh, by the end of this year, and the volume should be bigger than the, the, the first one. The figures which was nominated yesterday was about six uh, BCM. We consider that it is an additional new mean to sell gas. We're trying to diversify our activity uh, in Gazprom. When I told you before that uh, long-term contract is our main activity for the last uh, 40 years, but market, market are changing, and Gazprom also is changing. Our company, GMT, we are uh, working on foreign markets. We are working on different uh, trading uh, platforms in Europe. And it's very interesting, uh, new initiative of Gazprom to sell an auction from St. Petersburg, completely new activity. I think reflecting the requests of uh, European Commission also. We're working on the new markets, on the, on the market condition and market prices. Are we continuing? Okay, yes, we have uh, no more questions, but we prepared the question for the students once again. And uh, I asked the students to prepare to vote. And the question number two, two. Uh, you will see on the screen. We lost number two? I hope no. No, here it is. is here it is. Okay. Please. Is the energy relation between Russia Federation and the EU improving or worsening? It's already debated lengthily, but now it's up to you. Improving means A. Worsening. Please could vote. Even, could even more worsening. B. No, no answer or hard to answer. It's C. Up to you. Please vote. And here's the result. Stop the result. That's okay. an eagle score. <laughs> I think it's 45, 46, 43A, uh, and 42B. Okay, up to you. Next. So, the experts, what do you, what do you think about the results? Almost equal, equal results. A new speaker. Yes, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, as a student, when you have uh, had a statistic discipline in the university, there's uh, three types of lie. Uh, the special lie, unspecial lie, and statistics. And uh, here's the evidence uh, of this. Uh, uh, and uh, in principle, this is a very subjective uh, question. Uh, what is the criteria for... And, uh, for, uh, to increase uh, the relationship between Europe and uh, Russia, is it uh, if uh, the criterion the uh, supply volume? Uh, this is a uh, wrong answer, and uh, this is a very uh, subjective. And uh, uh, I think it's a little bit uh, provocative question. Okay, any other comments? Thank you very much. No? So let's continue our panel this way. Uh, and with pleasure, I provide the word to Vyacheslav Kusov, uh, Department of Exchange Trade Operations, Gazprom. Please, the presentation number five. Good morning, Администрации, администрации Газпром, являясь начальником управления анализа рынка биржевых товаров и контроля сделок. Ну, поскольку достаточно много студентов нашей аудитории присутствует, то я хочу сказать, что существенную часть своей жизни я посвятил также преподаванию, в частности экономико-математическим методом, в частности, мы со студентами прорабатывали вопросы использования математических методов, в частности, и на ликвидных площадках энергетических. И также достаточно существенную часть я проработал в газоэкспорте и был вовлечен в процесс создания газовой инфраструктуры в Европе, в частности, ПХГ и проектов Nord Stream. Сегодня в своем докладе я бы хотел остановиться на проблематике 
газовых хабов и газовых бирж как инструмент реализации природного газа в Европе. Стоит отметить, что стратегия «Газпрома» на европейском рынке направлена в первую очередь на поддержание надежного газоснабжения европейских потребителей, а также на повышение их экономической эффективности от экспортной деятельности. Ну и как любая коммерческая компания, мы, естественно, стремимся улучшить свою эффективность. Ну, собственно говоря, картинка, которая находится слева, вам уже представлялась моими коллегами неоднократно. Единственное, что стоит, на что стоит обратить внимание, это на биржи, которые функционируют на европейском рынке. И наиболее, скажем так, сложившейся биржей является биржа IC, Intercontinental Exchange, которая, по сути дела, является глобальной биржей, и европейский бизнес – это всего лишь часть глобального бизнеса. Деятельность данной биржи сосредоточена в как в области рынков капитала, так и в области торговли сырьевыми товарами. Стоит сказать, стоит поговорить о том, что хабы как таковые, значит, они могут делиться на виртуальные и физические. То есть если говорить о физических хабах, то точка продажи, физическая точка продажи, она совпадает, собственно говоря, с пунктом поставки. Если говорить о виртуальных хабах, то здесь, собственно говоря, вот если мы возьмем TTF, да, то в TTF существует несколько точек продажи газа. В частности, на границе Германии с Голландией, Бельгии с Голландией. Соответственно, многие эксперты говорят, что наиболее зрелый вот, на текущий момент хабы – это хаб НБП в Великобритании, хаб ТТФ Нидерланды, бельгийские хабы и, конечно же, немецкие хабы – NCG и Газпу. Стоит сказать, что Газпром достаточно ведет активную торговую деятельность на европейском рынке и занимает четвертую часть в европейском потреблении газа и третью часть в общих поставках газа европейским потребителям. Хотелось бы также остановиться на роли и месте хабов и бирж в системе реализации газа европейским потребителям. Производители газа в настоящий момент могут реализовывать газ как на биржах, ну, таких как ICE и EEX через брокеров, так и на OTC рынке, over the counter, так называемый вне биржевой рынок, который предполагает наличие двухсторонних сделок. В свою очередь, ну, как вы понимаете, данные контракты могут перепродаваться между собой, что в зависимости от конъюнктуры рынка увеличивает или уменьшает так называемый индекс ликвидности, о котором уже сегодня мои, мои коллеги говорили. И для того, чтобы, в общем-то, газ дошел до конечного потребителя, необходимо его также перепродать поставщикам, так называемым поставщикам конечных потребителей. В отдельных случаях возможна прямая продажа с хабов или с бирж 
определенным категориям промышленных потребителей. Если кратко остановиться на основных инструментах торговли на газовых хабах и биржах, уже мои коллеги из Газини уже об этом говорили, скажу, что в принципе инструменты торговли можно разделить на две большие группы. Это инструменты спотовой торговли, такие как в течение дня, Такие продукты, как в течение дня, день, выходные дни и недели. И инструменты форвардной торговли. Это торговля продуктами на месяц, на квартал, на сезон, на календарный и на газовый год. Профиль поставки, то есть вот поставка газа по этим продуктам, как правило, идет на равномерной основе в течение всего периода поставки. Достаточно важным, важным аспектом изучения хабов с нашей стороны является, скажем так, акцент на том, какие преимущества и недостатки могут давать хабы для участников рынка. Стоит сказать, что в настоящий момент преимуществами торговли газом на хабах пользуются в основном трейдеры и отчасти потребители газа. А недостатки вынуждены, скажем так, брать на себя производители. Ну, а одним из основных преимуществ торговли на газовых хабах является, конечно, развитие конкурентной среды рост ликвидности рынка, также немаловажно это диверсификация портфеля продаж для производителя и покупок для потребителя, а также снижение степени влияния продавцов и производителей газа друг на друга. Но, собственно говоря, как любая техническая, торговая, экономической системы хаба имеет определенные недостатки. Ну, один из недостатков – это отсутствие возможности единовременной покупки значительных объемов газа, в том числе на долгосрочную перспективу. Имеется в виду, ну, скажем так, разовая закупка достаточно больших объемов. Также механизм ценообразования не стимулирует развитие и совершенствование газотранспортной инфраструктуры. В свою очередь, как бы газотранспортная инфраструктура, значит, как мы неоднократно убеждались, стимулирует развитие газовых хабов. Например, развитие ПХГ и развитие так называемых cross-border points, трансграничных трубопроводов. Также уровень цен на продукты, представленные на хабе, определяется иногда в значительной степени не спросом и предложением, а индивидуальным или коллективным поведением участников торгов на хабе. В заключении позвольте сделать определенные некоторые выводы по поводу механизмов реализации по поводу возможности реализации газа на хабах, исходя из как бы, текущей ситуации на европейском рынке. Значит, хабы не стимулируют развитие газовой инфраструктуры, такой как добыча, транспорт, хранение. Ну, скажем так, впрямую не стимулируют, поскольку не дают гарантии, скажем так, долгосрочные покупки объемов и, и либо оплаты тарифа на транспортировку и хранение газа. Далее, значит, механизм ценообразования на хабах в меньшей степени гарантирует покрытие отраслевых издержек, нежели иные механизмы ценообразования. Ну, под иными механизмами мы понимаем нефтепродуктовую привязку, то есть формулу цены с нефтепродуктовой привязкой. При использовании стопроцентной привязки к хабам, ну, 
Стоит подумать о целесообразности ввода так называемого квотирования добычи газа и регулятора подобного ОПЕК. Ну, собственно говоря, вы знаете, что сейчас есть федерация стран-экспортеров газов, в которую Россия, в частности, входит, которая, в общем-то, призвана отстаивать данные интересы, в частности, при, торго при торговых отношениях. Ну, и для э, устойчивого развития компаний-поставщиков и потребителей газа э, необходимы взаимовыгодные условия контрактов на продажу газа, а также наличие долгосрочных контрактов э, с механизмом ценообразования, с привязками к продуктам, с высокой добавленной стоимостью и либо высокотехнологичным продуктом. Благодарю вас за внимание, готов ответить на ваши вопросы. И, как бы извиняюсь за моего коллегу Дмитрия Катульского, который не смог из-за достаточно напряженного графика присутствовать на нашей панельной дискуссии. On the pictures you see also fully what you are underlining, that if the price of all the hubs is the same, there is no margin to transport because there is, there is no room anymore to facilitate upstream transportation, cross-border transportation, even storages. I understand very well because I also come from the same uh, business as you come, that how you want to finance these upstream activities which are deep investments, long-term investments, and so on and so forth. So I can understand why Gazprom is more or less asking a podium how we have to deal with this kind of questions. In that respect, I, I have been wondering over the last couple of three, four years that the Russian state, that Gazprom, and even yesterday, it is clear that I think the statement by the Russians is we have 120 BCM on stock ready to deliver to Europe. So if that is the position, I can understand the European positions, well, you know, I don't care because there is enough and as long as the market is needed, they will supply because they have it on the shelf. They don't have to do anything for it. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit curious also from this technical political arena how you look to this well, more or less marketing power by Gazprom, that there is so much still available which could be delivered easily to Europe. Uh, yes, the question is uh, that uh, in, in principle, uh, if you're talking about uh, marketing power, that's why we're trying to, uh, for, to make, to format the additional uh, sales uh, channel uh, to Europe. And uh, uh, we are not uh, fixed just, uh, for example, on the traditional uh, pricing and uh, contract mechanism. And we are open and, uh, uh, to the other uh, sales mechanisms also in the spot market. And our subsidiary company, Gazprom Marketing and Trading, is uh, very active on in this market and uh, has very uh, long uh, and uh, very large experience uh, to working on uh, uh, the sport and the uh, liquid market. And uh, that's why we're uh, opening for uh, all new uh, mechanisms uh, which uh, help us to monetize uh, uh, our uh, production, uh, our uh, gas resources. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have not so much time to the end of uh, our section. So I... Uh, one question from the audience. <laughs> okay, so let's allow uh, one question for the, from the audience. Uh, sorry, just one, and then we continue with the presentation mm -hmm. and hope we have time to have more questions. Please. Uh, Roman Yakunin, Wysh School of Management, St. Petersburg Consulting University. I have a question for the representative of Gazprom. Now, practically all contracts of Gazprom are long-term contracts. For the conditions of buy or pay. In perspective, for 10-15 years, а сможет ли 
краткосрочная биржевая торговля на спотовом форуме на контрактами заменить долгосрочные? Ну, если вы говорите, скажем так, в аспекте, смотря как бы что вы имеете в виду под краткосрочной биржевой торговлей, то есть если я как бы вот в презентации своей как бы указал, что есть как бы спотовая да, торговля, да, есть инструменты день вперед, неделя, а есть как бы форвардная торговля. Если вы говорите о спотовой торговле, то, конечно, она не сможет полностью заменить. Если говорить о каких-то инструментах, значит, скажем, продажа газа на форвардах, на форвардных продуктах, на вперед на квартал, на полгода, на год, то в качестве дополнительного инструмента продажи и дополнительного инструмента монетизации, конечно, это будет возможно. Но э, учитывая как бы достаточно, э, скажем, большую, большой, э, скажем, э, величину месторождений и, э, скажем, доста достаточно большой срок э, окупаемости добычных проектов и газотранспортной инфраструктуры, значит, перейти на полностью, как бы, скажем так, э, на торговлю производными инструментами будет достаточно сложно. Thank you very much for your answer. So, uh, let me provide the word to the expert from NG, David Selfati, and the presentation influence of hubs on the actors of consumers' behavior. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk this morning. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk this morning. I understand we're a little bit short in time, so I'll try to, to condense my presentation. And it will be easy in the sense that lots of interesting things have been said this morning already, and uh, I'll be able to, to pass quickly on them. What I'll try to do for this presentation is to, of course, discuss about hub developments and the, the impact is that it has had on the, on the business in the gas industry. Uh, I also try to put it into what I believe is a broader perspective of the role and the, the right place natural gas can have in the, in the European energy mix. So let's start from this general context. It has been said notably by, by Yuri previously uh, that gas is a great energy. Basically, it has a perfect match with uh, the need for Europe of a greener energy. It's clean, it's highly flexible, cheap to store, so it's a perfect match with, uh, with intermittent renewable production. It's an affordable energy. Uh, just taking a random example, Russia. Uh, Russia has huge resources, very cost-effective. It's probably one of the cheapest cost-wise Uh, cheapest uh, energy that can uh, that can supply Europe need for energy. So, if we stay to this part of the discussion, uh, this is the this is dream case. Natural gas is uh, is the energy of the uh, of the 21st century. Uh, this is before we look into another key consideration for Europe, which is people talk about politics, but let, let's talk about social acceptability. It encompasses politics, it encompasses uh, lobbying, other energy, uh, coal, for instance, nuclear. All those guys are very good at lobbying uh, in favor of energy. And the fact is that despite the objective qualities of gas, which all experts would, uh, would acknowledge, gas has, uh, let's say, a, a key challenge ahead to convince people, to convince final customers and policymakers that it is the energy that is required and the most suited to, to meet the energy needs of, uh, of Europe. So long story short, gas is a great energy, it has a great potential, but it faces a big, huge challenge uh, to, to finally convince its, uh, its customers. And that's a challenge to all of us, gas, uh, gas people. So now moving closer to the To the, to the subject relating to hubs and how it, how it goes in this, uh, in this perspective. So that, that has been said, uh, uh, GasHub has, has developed massively uh, over the 10, 15 years. 
we have now reached a point where we believe it is uh, it has gone too far to to go backward. Gas gas hubs are here to stay. Uh, traded volumes are high. Liquidity uh, and price relevance is uh, has become uh, good enough. Uh, it is now an important on the physical side an important role to to supply final physical demands. So. Uh, from from the observation, gas is now gas hubs are now the let's say the the unavoidable framework for for the gas industry in Europe. Of course, that comes with questions and very legitimate questions, uh, such as is it a good signal for investment? How efficient those those marketplaces are? Uh, what's the effect of volatility? Does it disturbs the the price uh, uh, the price uh, definition mechanisms? Well, those are very interesting questions. By the way, it is applicable for any traded quantity. Same questions apply for stocks, for for interest rates, for exchange rates, etc. Uh, this is consubstantial, I would say, to to the marketplaces. But the sad truth is that these are mostly theoretical questions. And uh, well, if we were, if we want to live in the world we are living in, uh, the the single most important question is how to adapt to them. In this respect, I, I would like to uh, to uh, highlight an, I would say, uh, uh, property or characteristic of gas hubs. I mean, the role of hubs basically is to reveal price, to reveal the value, and which is somehow fun. Uh, and the way they have been developing in Europe is mostly they uncovered a very unpleasant truth, and. Uh, for uh, for gas professionals, hubs have had this let's say magical property to just put to your face the ugly truth huh, that uh, that we would have all preferred not to not to see in front. Huh. So one example, I'll give a few examples. One example is the the value of flexibility, which originally comes from storages, be there in the, in the, in Europe or or from the export countries, it comes also from LNG. Here, I've just uh, illustrated the, the the value of flexibility, which is highlighted through the hubs. And obviously, uh, hubs uncover the, the the sad truth that flexibility has the value of flexibility has enormously diminished over the last the last few years, uh, divided by three mostly in. Uh, from 20, 2008 to, uh, to today. Another, let's say, uh, consequence of the hub development is the, the value of transportation. We live in a market where there are lots and lots of uh, transportation capacity booked, way too much actually, uh, and where the markets are well supplied which leads to a situation where the, value, the market value of transportation is extremely low. And just to highlight this, uh, this situation, I've calculated uh, some ratios, which are basically the, the spread, average spread between the prices in two marketplaces, as compared to the transportation cost to physically transport gas from, the, from one of those marketplaces to the other. So figures uh, evolve uh, and change over other places, but Mostly what you can observe is that uh, there are way too much transportation capacity booked in Europe as compared to the, to the volumes. And that's the, the, uh, and that the value for it is, uh, has, has vanished. So if you hadn't had uh, hubs, you could probably stay in the you know, bilateral world and, and everyone would, would have had its own vision on the, on the value of that. But now there is an objective and clear signal for, for assessing this value, uh, this is, the, this is the, the, the reality we have to, we have to face. Uh, another consequence, or I would say uh, example, where hubs show the fundamentals of the market uh, is a fundamental shift uh, Europe has faced in the recent years between, uh, I would say, uh, supplier risk. Gas industry has, has developed in a, let's say, uh, in, uh, in a context of ensuring security of supply, assuming that there would not be enough gas for, for all, the, uh, all the consumption. The current, uh, I'm not talking about the long term, but the current uh, uh, gas market is actually more characterized by uh, demand risk. Uh, demand is weak 
gas super has almost vanished from from the from the energy mix, uh, and as as soon as there is a surge in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, gas gas supply side, prices prices drop, and this is a fact you could let's, let's say hide uh, with oil indexations or other kinds of price mechanisms. But this this is made clear and transparent through the through the hubs. So. So to, to conclude those, uh, those uh, few examples, uh, hubs may not reflect, you know, with an extreme precision value of things. You can always argue whether there are some bias, whether there are some irrationality and collective behaviors that modify what the actual uh, true value of things are. But it gives good all, all those magnitudes and, and basically put the finger where it hurts. So, so what kind of impact? Did that have on the on the business, so on the customer side, I would say the downstream downstream side, things have been extremely quick to adapt to adapt, so. and uh, gas uh, gas utilities like NG and, and and all the other players in in Europe uh, had to evolve extremely rapidly to to this new environment. So. Uh, now final prices are driven by the hub, hub prices. Uh, that that's worked for both flexibility and and the, the volume, the actual, actual volume of gas. Uh, so this, this part of the industry has evolved extremely rapidly. Things have been much more difficult on the supply side. It was highlighted before, uh, the cornerstone of the, of the gas industry in Europe is the long-term supply contracts between, between gas producers and, and large importers uh, like E.ON, like, uh, like NG, like ENI in Italy. Uh, and if you remember the, the few examples that I, I gave before, all those examples lead to an unpleasant and difficult questions to be solved in the frame of those long-term contracts. Uh, for instance, those contracts provide some flexibility to customer, and this flexibility has a cost to produce. That's, uh, that's uh, unarguable. Uh, nonetheless, the value, market value of this flexibility has now decreased. So what's the, what do we do with this flexibility? Do we pay the cost for it? Do we pay the market value for it? I uh, can imagine how intense the debate is on this one. Same thing for the transportation cost. Gas producers generally, and that's probably true for most of the uh, gas, uh, gas uh, producers across Europe, have had a strategy to go close to the markets, to get as close as possible to the, to the markets. And guess what? This turned out to be a very loss-making strategy. Now, now you have to pay transportation capacity throughout Europe to reach a final market, which basically has the same price as the one which is a thousand kilometers uh, uh, closer to your uh, to your production sites. So, so that's again uh, a fact that needs to be to be reflected in the in the long-term contracts and makes things quite quite complicated. Last but not least, <clears throat> I mean that, that's a very broad subject. We could have made a, a whole presentation on this one, but now that Europe is mostly characterized, I would say today and for the short, medium term, is more characterized by demand risk. Uh, gas buyers, which are bound to, with take or pay clause, so the obligation to take gas whether, whenever, uh, and whether or not they, they have demand for it. So. This materializes as a, as a huge burden. So, this obviously puts some, some highlight on the kind of debate uh, they have been and are still ongoing between gas producers and, uh, and gas buyers. And for those who are not familiar with, with that, I would say since 2009, so it's, it almost started six years ago, uh, huge negotiations, I would say permanent re renegotiations have been ongoing, sometimes extremely tensed. Uh, you may have seen in the press lots of arbitration, which was basically uh, not a practice at all of the, uh, of the gas industry, but has become a standard, almost a standard procedure that has created lots of tension between gas, gas producers and, and gas buyers. Uh, and now let's, let's take a step back from that. So the, the industry has been you know, deep diving into th those questions and arguing on an extremely uh, tense basis for, for years. At the end of the day, what, what are the fundamentals? Gas producers are interested to sell 
and to sell a lot if possible. No? Gas buyers are interested to sell to their customers to make a margin for it. No? So if you look with it's outside the nitty gritty of the of those contractual relationships. No? Interests are still aligned. Uh, gas buyers and gas producers are on the same are on the same side. And if you come back to the very earlier, uh, the very first slide I presented about the on one side the advantages of gas and on the other side the challenges to to its uh, let's say emergence as a key energy for the 21st century. Politics lobbying. This is this is the reality gas buyers have to face and. Basically, gas buyers in Europe are the, the best, maybe the only, but the best ambassadors uh, for natural gas. So my point here is that gas producers and gas buyers are natural allies. They should work together. And after more than six years arguing about how to adapt to this new market context, it seems to me it is now time to, to put an end to those discussions, to finalize the transition, and start really working together uh, as partners and uh, as allies uh, in order to make and to, to enable the, the bright future of gas it deserves. Thank you very much, David. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, uh, no time for the question to David, so I provide the word uh, for the final presentation, uh, let's say it's a culminating presentation of uh, Konstantin von Oldenburg, uh, VNG company. Uh, with, uh, and Konstantin will try to answer the question Gas hub, a tool or threat to traditional relationship between supplier and buyer. Please. Yes. Pожалуйста, все встаньте. Алла, я могу встать. Алла, я могу. Все встаньте, пожалуйста. Здесь слишком много, который играет сотовым телефоном или кто-то уже спал. Алла, я могу, ох ты точно. И садитесь. Спасибо. Я надеюсь, сейчас у меня есть ваше внимание. I will switch to English. Two words on me. I'm representing Verbund Netzgas, the third biggest gas supplier, gas seller in Germany. I'm responsible for gas purchase from Russia since nearly 12 years for different companies, but mainly my focus is on Russia. We heard a lot today. Allow me to walk a bit because I've been sitting here as long as you did. <laughs> um, we heard a lot about hubs already. I want to shorten it really. I got the question, is the gas hubs, are they a tool, an instrument or threat for the traditional relationship? As I already said in the beginning, I'm a lawyer and my answer is it depends what you make out of it like most of the time in life. We can make out the best or it can go to the worst. Which side? Sorry, I missed one chart there. We show, saw a lot of charts about showing what hubs we have today in Europe. TTF, NCG, France, Italy, what no one said here, in the beginning when hubs were introduced, all big companies, and I think I can say that for the producing side and the utilities, refused to accept them. Because hub means transparency, transparency means in trade business, less margins. So we all neglected the existence, the importance, everything altogether. Some it took longer, some it took shorter. And it brought us close to what you see on this chart. It's the so-called innovator's dilemma. If you see the list, or what does it mean? It means if a company sticks to old style, old practice, ignoring what happens in the market, these companies disappear because the business case disappears. There's no model to earn money. If you look, start from the beginning, sailing ship companies who refuse to build steam ships for whatever reason, because it has never been the case for the last 500 years, they disappeared. If you go to, to publishing companies, cyclopedias, who said internet, what is internet? It's something military uses. It will never be a competitor. They disappeared. I will now jump the more modern ways you're more familiar with, the iPad 
and the notebook, the book and the e-book, and we'll jump to the last example. Our business was close to become a study case for the innovator's dilemma as well, because we came from oil product index long-term contracts, delivered at a flunge, delivered at a measuring point. This was the molecule we transferred to the client, and we did not realize for quite a while, and some haven't realized it fully yet, that it's a hub-based pricing required by the clients. And this is a decisive sentence. The clients require hub-based pricing. Why do they do that? If you buy a Mercedes, what do you do? You go to the Mercedes company you know next door, you go to the neighborhood on the right, you go to the neighborhood on the left, and then today we are very modern, we check in the internet, we take the cheapest price, we go to the guy we know and say, I want this price. And you feel good. Why do you feel good? Because you think you have a competitive fair price. It can be higher, it can be lower, but it gives you the feeling, I get this, what everybody gets. The neighbor got the Mercedes for the same price as I did. It's transparency, which from the trade point of view is horrible because it's less margin. One step back to good old days. We had the producers, indigenous producers means European producers. We had imports from various countries. They were all mentioned already. We, as a wholesaler, we are classical old style wholesaler. We got the gas and we delivered it to the clients. What did we do, we structured the volumes as already said before, long-term contracts offer a structure of roughly 7,000 hours per year. The clients request something like 5,000, so we have to cover that gap. Today, and this was shown already, we have the imports, the producers, who can directly go to the hubs, bypassing the traditional sales channels, which I'm the one in the middle, the intermediate, is not always fun. Forget what is written on the top, just look at the picture. If the producer bypasses first the wholesaler, directly goes to the retailer, and later goes to big industry companies, they buy directly at the hub. So they bypass the whole chain in between. In the first moment, you can say as a producer, that's pretty good because I get the margin in between. But what you miss on that side is what was the value proposition, what was the added value by the intermediate? What did all these importing companies, the wholesale companies do? We did the structuring. Only VNG has a sales department of 50 people. We have an IT you cannot imagine. Let's make it more simple. We have access to 1,200 clients in Germany if I go now to Gazprom Export, correct me if I'm wrong, you have seven big clients in Europe, more or less. Seven big companies. For long-term contracts. For long-term contracts. For long-term contracts. So what people you need for six, seven big contracts, where you know I have a guaranteed volume. These long-term contract, contract partners offered me, I take your volume, whatever happens, if I don't take it, I will pay you a penalty, so-called minimum pay. This is what the producer got, the guarantee for the volume, which was at the same time the question was raised earlier, or the guarantee to the banks, because if you invest billion of euros in upstream, in Yamal, or in Siberia, or in infrastructure, you have to project, uh, you have to finance a project. So minimum, minimum, 50%, I would say 70% has to come from a bank. Who finances that if you cannot say, maybe I sell it next year on the hub and the year afterwards, but maybe not because the demand is not there or LNG was cheaper. This shows the green line is the border price in Germany. Statistically, I refer to you, Vyacheslav, what you said about statistics lie, special lie, and the lie you made yourself, but this is the official published border price. The red line is the gas pool that's one of the hubs in Germany, in eastern Germany, middle Germany. If you look at the gap, the, when the green line was above the red line since the financial crisis in 2008, you can imagine 
who was happy with the pricing, the one who had an oil price linked contract formula, and this is what was referred to by David to the adaption of the long term contract. They had to be adapted to the market because the clients only were willing to offer hub prices because they wanted the Mercedes like the neighbor. Since 2014-15, you can see that the border price came more or less into the range of the, of the hub price. That's all my presentation, not very sophisticated. I come back to my lawyer's education. It depends. It can be a threat for the point of view of the intermediate if the producer believes he can bypass me because there is no added value of structuring, of market development. That means building infrastructure, building storages, running the storages. Then it's a threat. But it can be an instrument, an enhancing tool, if it's taken as a price signal of the market, which from the point of the producer, a price signal he can check himself on the screen every day. It's not something that an agent comes and says, the market is like this. You cannot check that, you just have to believe me. No. And then the next question is, I'm responsible for purchase and portfolio management. Portfolio management means I always check what is the best alternative to buy the gas. Is it the long-term contract? Is it the hub? And if someone offers me, you get the same, the hub price, for the long-term contract, that means for the take or pay. I simply say, okay, then I, please, I don't want the take or pay. I just buy in the hub the volume I need today and I don't take an obligation for higher volumes, which I still don't know whether I sell them or not. So this is actually what we have to consider is coming back to the old idea. You take the volume risk, someone takes the price risk, and the instrument to enhance that, I think, is a quite transparent pricing, is the market price. That's it. I don't ask you to stand up again. Thank you very much. So we just have a few minutes. Uh, maybe you have a question to this very interesting presentations or to all other experts, please. Two, two questions. Lady, ladies first. <laughs> uh, and you have a comment, okay. Well, I have just one question. Uh, we all understand here that it must be some kind of a compromise between a gas producer who asks for oil linked indexation just because banks ask for oil link linked guarantees as well and between um, and customers who want hub prices uh, spot prices hub prices do you think that forward contracts like one year forward contracts could be such a compromise at least uh, for some time that's my question to everyone yes please well, it's, I mean, it, it might be part of the solution. Um, the, big, the big point is you, you are pointing rightly to the fact that we need some kind of, of a compromise. But when you talk about a compromise, of course, you need to make sure that finally that is something that, that is attractive for both parties. So the, the benchmark for any compromise must be the answer to the question, can both parties live with this and have both parties a possibility to thrive in the market and to still gain a profit. And that's basically at the core of the question. Um, and and that's, that's the, let's say, also the core of our discussions, where we try to sort out how can we ensure that both parties um, still can survive in this business and feel that it is attractive. And looking at forward prices might be one possibility, um, but it still needs to ensure that a buyer can also gain a profit on this. I mean, look, when you, when you agree, for instance, on having a forward quotation in your, in your purchase contract and you have to sell based on forward prices to your customers, you essentially gain nothing. You have to entertain uh, the sales force and the IT infrastructure, as Konstantin mentioned, uh, but you have not yet earned a single penny on which you can live. And... The big question is how can we really sort out this issue to find a compromise that is attractive for both parties? 
one, one addition to that, yeah. what I was talking about added value, we, we heard about a lot about churn ratios at the hubs. Churn ratio means it's virtual traded volumes without any physical delivery. If I were a producer, I should be interested in a physical delivery, someone who offers me the access to the client, the gas is burned. It's not traded and banks and financial traders earn money on that. No, you want it to be burned in a house or in industry plant. And then you have to ask someone who can provide that access. Oh, okay, uh, any other answers, comments on this question? So please, the comment from the... Прощение, что на русском. <смех> Прошу взять наушники, коллег. В действительности я, наверное, единственный, кто здесь представляет реально работающую в России газовую биржу. Санкт-Петербургская международная товарно-сырьевая биржа. У нас проходят торги природным газом на внутреннем рынке. Последние торги с объемами поставки на месяц дали объем миллиард двести миллионов миллионов кубов для России достаточно хорошие уже в объем, учитывая, что мы начали торги в ноябре прошлого года, по-моему, с 20 миллионов. В этом месяце мы должны запустить торги с поставкой на сутки вперед. И это тоже будет революцией на внутреннем рынке газа в России, потому что «Газпром» до сих пор таких инструментов не использовал в принципе. И, в общем-то, вопрос здесь очень важный в чем. Вы допускают ли производители разность цен, допускают ли, а ли они то или иное свободное как бы, ценообразование? «Газпром» И в этом есть существенное различие нашего экспортного рынка и внутреннего рынка. Я говорю о рынке природного газа, потому что по сжиженному как бы, газу другая картина. «Газпром» у нас сейчас единственный экспортер. На внутреннем рынке это не так. Есть другие производители газа и с началом биржевой торговли они оказались допущены на рынок. До этого они вынуждены были, ну, на наш взгляд, по заниженным ценам продавать свой газ «Газпрому». Результат торгов, для понимания. В зависимости от региона цены на ГРС выхода по разным регионам, ниже цен ФСТшных плюс там, транспортировка и соответствующие надбавки на 5-14%. Интересно ли это потребителям? Да. Интересно ли это Газпрому? А, оказывается, тоже да, потому что в некоторых регионах значительную часть покупки газа делают межрегион газы. Как ни странно. А, является ли цель наша и то, что вот будет сейчас выполнять биржу на будущий год, это то, чтобы выполнить те нормы, установленные постановлением правительства, и выйти на уровень внутренней биржевой торговли газом в 35 миллиардов кубов. Это будет примерно 20% внутреннего рынка. На наш взгляд, это будет тот уровень, который позволит работать уже с биржевыми индексами на вне биржевом рынке. Вот здесь все там говорилось о Европе. У нас Несколько своеобразный путь, но, на мой взгляд, он не менее рыночный. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the comment. So I also stand. Uh, I'm sorry, but we have no more time to continue our discussion. Uh, I'd like to sum up a little bit uh, and thank, first of all, thank all our experts that they come to and join to our discussion. I know that it's very difficult uh, nowadays to find time to come and to spend with us more than two hours. So thank you very much. Uh, I also like to uh, thank all the organizers and also the students who act 
actively participate here during the session, ask the questions, and I'd like to underline and agree with Mr. Verabian that this sphere is very interesting, and uh, we'd like young generations to join this sphere, to be more interested in gas hubs, gas exchange trading, and uh, please read more, study, and we, uh, from the part from the universities, we try to help you in this process. And we have prepared presents for our expert, and thanks them again. So girls, please. Um, Mr. Von Oldenburg, thank you very much. Mr. Sebastian Grablenhoff, thank you very much. Ross McWay, thanks again. Mr. Virabian, thank you very much. David Salfati, and G, thank you very much. Mr. Kusov, thank you very much. Elena Rinalda, thank you very much. And also, thank you very much, my colleague Gerd Grieving from Gastero, who works a lot on this section with me, and thank you very much. So, <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So, um, I think that, I hope that you agree with me that our section was very interesting, and I wish you good luck on this international case in the afternoon and hope to see you soon. Thank you.